Hello, Year 10. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick lecture today on the Berlin crisis of 1961. Um, just first of all, quite a quick one to mention. Do not get it confused with the Berlin blockade and Berlin airlift, which is in 1948 and 9. It's a classic mistake that students always make. They are different. This is about the building of the Berlin Wall. Um, OK, before we um, look at the Berlin crisis, we're going to start with a quick 10 question quiz. Um, now, the first five or six are going to be about the U2 crisis that we looked at um, last lesson. Um, and then I'm going to give you a few quiz questions going further back, um, looking at what we've done already about what happened in Germany after the Second World War to help us with some of the stuff for today. Just see how many of these you can get. Um, make sure, like last time, so either in your books or just in your line paper, Tart with today, Berlin crisis 1961. Just write down the answers and then give yourself a uh, score at the end and write down any ones that you missed there. OK, so first of all. Right, first of all, what year was the U2 spy incident? So what year was it? Number two. And um, what was the name of the U2 pilot who was captured? So what was the name? the U2 pilot who was captured. Number three, in which city was a peace sunk planned two weeks after the incident? So in which city was a peace summit planned two weeks after the U2 spy incident? Right, key word from last lesson last lecture even, right, what key word described the improvement or warming of relations between the Soviets and the US in the late 1950s? So what key word described the improvement slash warming of relations between the Soviets and the US in the late 1950s? Give you a clue, it begins with a T. Right, number five. Right, what did Khrushchev do at the peace summit after Eisenhower refused to apologize or rule out future U2 flights? Okay, these ones going slightly further back now. Right, at Yalta, just remember the first key post-war conference or just so first conference to decide what would happen post-war. Um, at Yalta, what had the Allies agreed would happen to Germany once the, the uh, war was over? So at Yalta, what had the Allies agreed would happen to Germany once the war was over? Right, number seven, what year was the Berlin blockade? So in what year did Stalin blockade West Berlin? Right, the introduction of what in the West German zone triggered Stalin into launching the blockade of West Berlin? So the introduction of what in the West German zones triggered Stalin into launching the blockade of West Berlin? Right, number nine. Very simply, what did the Allies do in response to the blockade of West Berlin? And final question, slightly harder one. Right after the blockade ended in April 1949, Germany was divided into two new states: the capitalist FDR in West Germany and the communist what in East Germany. So, what were the initials for the East German communist state set up after the Berlin blockade? OK, so hopefully you've had a chance now to answer all 10 of those. So make sure to write down any ones you missed out or correct any that you got wrong and uh, see how many you managed to get at 10. OK, so first of all, um, the U2 spy incident was in 1960, in May 1960 to be precise. Right, the pilot who was shot down was Gary Powers. Um, and the reason that the shooting down of his plane was significant was that two weeks after the plane was shot down, there was this scheduled uh, peace summit in Paris that was meant to um, de-escalate the Cold War uh, between Eisenhower and Khrushchev. And obviously the U2 spy incident kind of wrecked that conference. So um, 
ruin that opportunity for de-escalating the Cold War. Now, the reason that the conference happened was that for number four, you had this thaw in the night in the late 1950s. Remember this uh, period where because Khrushchev had come to power um, on the back of de-Stalinization and promised peaceful coexistence with the West, the Western were willing to listen. And also in America at that time, there is a thaw in the attitude towards the Soviets because McCarthyism has kind of been wound down. So it's um, it's more of a political possibility for Eisenhower to negotiate with the Soviets. So you have the thaw in the late 1950s and the culmination of that was meant to be the Paris Peace Summit. Now for number five, Khrushchev stormed out of the Paris Peace Summit after Eisenhower refused to apologize and also refused to rule out future flights over the Soviet Union. So Khrushchev used that as an opportunity to embarrass the US by storming out of the conference and the Paris Peace Summit came to an end. Now at the Yalta Conference, um, the Allies agreed to divide um, Germany at the end of the war into four zones of occupation. So there would be Western zones controlled by Britain, France and the USA, and an Eastern zone occupied by the Soviet Union before they then figured out what was going to happen with Germany over the medium and long term. Okay. Now the Berlin blockade, so Stalin's blockading of West Berlin began in 1948 and the trigger for that was when the Allies introduced a new currency, the Deutschmark, and you can give yourself a bonus tick if you've got the Deutschmark into the Western zones. And the reason that triggered Stalin is because it suggested to him that the Allies were planning to go ahead with creating a West German state. Um, and he wanted to try and get the Allies to abandon uh, West Berlin um, or back down from their plans to um, set up a new West German state supported by the United States. Um, now, we obviously know that because the um, Soviets cut off the land and train routes to West Berlin, and the Allies then launched the Berlin Airlift. So that attempt to supply the West Berliners by air um, for the duration of the blockade until Stalin gave up. So as long as you've got something on the lines that they launched the Berlin Airlift or supplied it from there, that's great. Um, and then finally, after the blockade ends, Germany is then formally divided into two new countries. Now, the West German state is known as the FDR or FRG, depending how you acronym it, um, the Federal Republic of Germany. And then the communist East Germany is the GDR, the German Democratic Republic. Okay, so it's the GDR in East Germany. Uh, just to say quickly, guys, you should have this knowledge organizer for the Berlin crisis. It might be worthwhile having that out in front of you just while we talk through the main events, um, just because it's quite good, particularly for this little chart of the causes, events and outcomes. It's quite good for sort of following the flow of the main events. And obviously, you've got the timeline here um, so you can sort of see the connection between the earlier bits of Germany and then what happened in the early 1960s. OK, and the map is quite helpful as well. OK, so starting off with a bit of background. So the Berlin crisis 1961 is the crisis that leads to the building of the Berlin Wall, one of the uh, most sort of potent symbols of the Cold War. So today we're going to look at um, the background to what was happening in West Berlin and East Germany more generally um, that led to the building of the wall and then kind of looking at the uh, impact that it had on international relations between the Soviets and the Americans. Now, just to rewind back a little bit. so. Remember, we saw that in 1945 at the Yalta Conference, a few months before the war ended, the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin, sat down and decided what would happen to Germany immediately at the end of the war. And what they agreed was that Germany would be divided into four zones of occupation controlled by Britain, America, France and the Soviets. Um, until they decided what would happen with Germany in the long term. Um, as part of that agreement as well, though, Berlin, which is deep inside the Soviet zone, was also divided up because Berlin was obviously the capital city. This was only meant to be a temporary arrangement while they worked out a longer term plan. So the Soviets agreed to allow uh, the French, British and Americans to have the western half of Berlin um, as an occupation zone. OK, so West Berlin um, is controlled by and Britain, America and France, and that becomes important later on. Now, three years after the ending of the war, you've got the development of these tensions over Germany. Now, without going into too much detail, there were lots of differences that the Allies kind of had at this point. So one thing that was obviously three years after the war, the kind of uh, grander lines that had been built up by um, by the sort of fighting against Nazi Germany in the war had kind of ended. So the relations between America and the Soviets have obviously become a lot worse. In that time period, you've had, obviously had uh, the Truman Doctrine kind of escalating tensions with the Soviet Union. You've also had the Soviets installing 
um, communist puppet regimes all over Eastern Europe in the Eastern Bloc in their sphere of influence. So the relationship is much worse by 1948. Now in Germany, the difference is are over a few things. One of the biggest ones is over the issue of reparations. So the Soviets took a lot more reparations, compensation, money um, from the Eastern zones of Germany than the Americans and British did. Um, that was to do obviously with the Soviets being much more damaged in the Second World War than the Americans or the British had. And that led to differences. The Americans really wanted to see actually the Western zones um, rebuilt um, to an extent that the Soviets weren't really happy with. Now, the thing that um, triggered the Berlin blockade was that in the Western zones, the Allies introduced a new currency, the Deutschmark, and Stalin took that as a clear indication that the Allies were planning to set up a new West German state, which he didn't want. He wanted Germany to remain unified either as a neutral state or kind of carrying on the sort of um, status quo of, you know, having a single nation with different occupied zones. Um, so to try and get the Americans and the British and the French to back down on this plan, he um, blockaded West Berlin. So the West Berlin at this time is controlled by the French, the British and the Americans. And he wanted to use the blockade of it as a kind of bargaining ship. So they cut off the the road routes and the train routes into West Berlin um, to try and essentially force the Allies to leave West Berlin or to come to the negotiating table. Now, what the Allies obviously did in response to that was they flew in supplies through these through air corridors and essentially kept the city supplied by air until Stalin eventually backed down. Now, at the ending of the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift, um, Germany became formally divided into two new states. So remember, in the first few years, it's not two nations. It's still a single country, just with these four different powers occupying different sections of it. The ending of the Berlin blockade, though, led to actually the zones being formally divided into two new nations. OK, so you had West Germany, um, which was the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germany, um, which was a you know pro-Western uh, liberal capitalist um, society um, aligned with the United States in the Cold War and then the eastern zones became East Germany the German Democratic Republic which was communist okay so they had their own flags they had their own systems of government um, and they were essentially two completely different states after that now the thing that was odd though was that West Berlin still remained part of this um, West German nation so even though it was deep inside the eastern zone it remained part of West Germany, um, which caused a lot of profit, problems for the Soviets and the East German government for reasons we'll talk about now. Okay, so having this little island of West Germany deep inside their territory caused a number of problems. Now, the first one, which was the Soviets' official explanation for why they built the Berlin Wall, um, was because of Western spying. So obviously, West Berlin was a really good launch pad for spying on the rest of the Eastern Bloc. So um, the CIA operated out of West Berlin, giving out radio broadcasts, and it was also a good way of gaining entry into East Germany and then the rest of the Eastern Bloc. So Western spying was a problem from West Berlin. Now, the bigger problem, though, was a problem of defectors. Okay, now de a defector, good keyword, and you might want to jot it down if you um, don't know the word. So a defector is someone who leaves their country, political party or other group and joins an opposing country, party or group. So a defector is somebody, some, someone who switches from one side to another. OK, so that could be switching from one political party to another. It could be switching from one country to another. Or you might use it in more like informal speech to talk about someone switching, say, football teams. Yeah, you defect from one team to another team. Um, and we're familiar with the idea of defectors now. So we think about the idea of there are defectors from North Korea who escape and go to South Korea. So they switch from North Korea to South Korea. Or, you know, more informally, you can think about the idea of Cristiano Ronaldo defecting from Real Madrid to Juventus. OK, switching teams, switching from one side to another. Now, defections became a big problem from West Berlin um, because the border between East Berlin and West Berlin was much more porous. It was much easier to get through than the border between East and West Germany here. Um, so as a result, West Berlin almost becomes this um, drain plug hole, which East Germans or people from the rest of the Eastern Bloc can use to escape to the West. OK, so it's this drain plug which is sucking out. Lots of people who want to leave the Eastern Bloc states to escape to, to the West, okay? Um, now, if you're going to learn one key figure for this, 
in 12 years after the Berlin blockade, before the building of the Berlin Wall, 3 million East Germans became defectors. Okay, so they escaped from East Germany to West Germany, most of them using West Berlin as the means to escape. Okay, so you could get into West Berlin, you could then use the railway lines um, or roads to West Germany, which were free and accessible um, to escape to the West. And the big problem as well was not just that 3 million people escaped, which was a lot, that's about 15% of East Germany's population in those 12 years. They tended to be younger, and also really importantly, the best educated and skilled. So East Germany's doctors, its engineers, its architects, its lawyers, the, the sort of backbone of the East German economy, okay? Um, lots of them could see the kind of uh, greater levels of prosperity in West Berlin just from their windows in East Berlin, um, and the, also the obviously the extra freedoms that um, West Germans enjoyed. So lots of them saw that and then used West Berlin as a means to escape for a life in the West. Okay, so three million in the escape, and that was a huge problem. Now we looked last um, lecture at the Paris Peace Summit of May 1960, which was obviously torpedoed because of the U2 incident with Gary Powers. Okay, now one of the things that Eisenhower and Khrushchev were um, meant to sit down and resolve at that meeting was the future of West Berlin. Um, Khrushchev was still keen for the Allies to try and leave West Berlin because of the problems it was causing. Um, and the idea of that summit was to try and resolve some of those issues. But obviously, that gets put on the back burner because of the U2 incident. Now, what sort of changed, though, was in 1961, um, there was a new president who comes to power. Eisenhower, after stepping down, is replaced by a Democrat, President John F. Kennedy. Okay, Now, Kennedy um, was the youngest president ever elected at that that time um is very strongly anti-communist but at the same time his kind of youthfulness and idealism uh, means that he's seen as a sort of break with the past for lots of americans when they vote for him um but khrushchev really saw his election as an opportunity because kennedy was over 20 years younger than him he was a lot less politically experienced so khrushchev thought that kennedy's election would be an opportunity that the soviet leadership could exploit to gain a uh, greater foothold um, in world affairs now, three months into Kennedy's presidency, the replacement summit that was set up for one year later to make up for the Paris Peace Summit falling apart was set up in Vienna, in Austria. Um, and again, they were sitting down to discuss a number of issues, but one of the most important ones was the future of West Berlin. OK, now Khrushchev basically tried to intimidate Kennedy at this summit um, to sort of test him, essentially, to see if he could kind of like throw his weight around to get more concessions from the Americans. Um, this quote, which I quite enjoy, from Kennedy to a New York Times journalist after the summit. He said, it was the toughest thing in my life. He just beat the hell out of me. I've got a terrible problem. He thinks I'm inexperienced and have no guts. Until we remove those ideas, we won't get anywhere with him. So Kennedy was aware of the fact that Khrushchev saw him as this kind of young, naive leader that he could essentially kind of bully. Um, so he therefore felt that he needed to stand up to Khrushchev. And we see that both in the um, Berlin crisis this this week, but also when we look at the Cuban Missile Crisis um, in the year afterwards. And it's again Kennedy feeling that he has to stand up to Khrushchev because he's aware that Khrushchev has this perception that he's this young, naive president that he can essentially kind of push around. Now, at the Vienna summit, Khrushchev demands again that the Allies leave West Berlin. He sets them an ultimatum and says they have to leave. Um, but Kennedy and the Americans refused to budge and say they won't be leaving West Berlin. Um, so then he's left with a problem. He's got this problem of the spies and particularly the defectors from East Germany to the West. Um, and he decides eventually that he's going to have to build a wall. Now, why does he do that? Probably pretty obvious from before. The point is that, well, if we can't get the Allies to leave West Berlin, but we need to find a way of stopping both spies getting into the Eastern Bloc and all these East Germans escaping to the West, sort of ruining the image of communism, um, we're just going to build off a, build a wall around West Berlin to seal it off from the rest of the uh, country so people can't use it as an escape valve anymore to escape for life in the West. Now, Initially, um, Khrushchev was actually quite reluctant to build the wall because he was not, he was aware of the fact that obviously the damage it would do to communism's image that they were having to build a wall to essentially keep people in what was meant to be a worker's paradise. Um, 
but he decided that on balance they weren't going to go to war to force the allies to leave west berlin but then equally he needed to do something to stop the spying into east germany but then also you know for the east german government to support them by stopping and um, this means of um, east germany's most skilled workers escaping for life in the west so on the 13th of august so a couple of months after the vienna summit they spend a month or two setting up this plan to build this wall okay now the idea is that on the night of the 13th of august on a saturday um they surround west berlin with um east german soldiers okay and they've got all these sort of stockpiled uh, building materials um and what they do overnight literally it is overnight is west berlin is surrounded by a line of soldiers and barbed wire okay so when the wall initially goes up overnight on saturday the 13th of august and um, it's literally just barbed wire all the way around west berlin and the idea is over the following week they're going to upgrade that from being a barbed wire wall into a concrete wall okay um and they have to do it very quickly because obviously they're aware of the fact that if they give people lots of notice then people will use that as an opportunity to to defect and obviously that led to a lot of tragic circumstances where sometimes you had families or people with girlfriends or wives who would be stuck on the other side of the wall the night it went up and they were obviously separated and sometimes the, for decades until the end of the cold war um, so that was a really tragic event for lots of um, lots of berlin is that separation that took place okay uh, this is just a very famous photo of an east german soldier who when the barbed wire went up basically realized that if he, if he was going to defect to the west this was his last opportunity so there's this famous video of him hopping over the barbed wire into west berlin um to escape from east germany so that became a very iconic photo of the building of the uh, of the wall now in the years after 1960 um the wall gradually became um more and more sophisticated um so eventually you ended up with this much more elaborate system so when the wall first goes up, it's literally just this wall here between West Berlin and East Berlin. But over the sort of next 10, 15 years, the wall became more and more sophisticated. And eventually what you ended up with was actually you had this one wall. You then had this no man's land that was built and then a second wall. So if you were in East Berlin trying to escape, you'd eventually have to climb over this wall, um, which was built with these kind of curved edges at the top, which made it very hard to climb over. If you managed to get over that wall, um, there were then these signal fences where basically if you when you went through them it connected a circuit which then set off an alarm in these guard towers you then have to run across and um, there was this concrete strip down the middle which um, border guards with dogs would constantly be walking up and down you'd run across there and then over here you then have to get past the searchlights of the guard towers who would have been alerted by the signals going off over here um, and the idea was that these soldiers would have orders to shoot anyone trying to cross over the wall into West Berlin. Um, so again, that was why there were very, very few escapes after the wall became more sophisticated um, to life in the West. So it became more and more sophisticated and it became very, very hard to escape from East Berlin to West Berlin after that. Now, going back to the actual building of the wall um, in 1961, 1961, not 1960, in 1961 when the wall was built. Um, at first, Kennedy's initial response is that they send an official complaint to Moscow, but they don't actually do anything. They kind of are quite apathetic about accepting that this is probably the best situation possible. Um, and the line from the Americans was, as long as West Berlin remained free and West Berliners could travel to West Germany, the US wouldn't um, intervene militarily. They weren't going to fight a war for East Berlin. So as long as West Berlin was allowed to stay part of West Germany and West Berliners could still travel freely to West Germany, and they kind of accepted that they couldn't really do much about the building of the wall. Now, the only time that there was an escalation that nearly led to a conflict was a couple of months after the building of the wall in October 1961, there's this famous standoff at Checkpoint Charlie. Okay. Now, um, what happened after the Berlin Wall was built is you had the, a number of checkpoints, I think there were five in total, but I'm not entirely sure about that. There were these checkpoints, which were essentially border crossings between West Berlin and, and East Germany, um, which were, you know, staffed by East German border guards. Now, the point was that a small number of privileged West Berliners were able to travel to East Berlin with 
with uh, the right permits. Um, and there were these American um, diplomats, so people working at the American embassy, who had tickets to go and see a theatre production in East Berlin, they had all the right papers to get in, um, and they tried to cross at Checkpoint Charlie, which was this famous checkpoint between East and West Berlin, um, but they were blocked from going by the East Berlin uh, government, even though they had the right permits. Um, now, at which point the leader of the American army in West Berlin, a slightly hot-headed individual called General Clay, um, he tried to force the East Berliners to take these diplomats into East Berlin, so he kind of got into a standoff with them. Um, so he sends these this American military escort to Checkpoint Charlie to try and escort these diplomats across the border into East Berlin. Um, now, what the Soviets in the East German government do in response is sending their own tanks at the opposite end of Checkpoint Charlie, and you get this military standoff oh, sorry, between the um, Soviets and the Americans at Checkpoint Charlie, sort of facing each other down in a kind of Mexican standoff. Now, over the next 16 hours, it, NATO were kind of put on high alert. It looked like an actual conflict could break out um, at this point over Checkpoint Charlie. Um, but eventually the Soviets and the Americans negotiated and they sort of um, initiated this tactical withdrawal where, you know, the American tanks would reverse five meters and the Soviets would then reverse five meters on that side and then so on and so forth, going back and forth until the situation was de-escalated. Um, but that was the only real time that the uh, building of the Berlin Wall nearly resulted in a uh, conflict directly. Now, another big event a couple of years after the building of the wall is Kennedy went to visit West Berlin uh, and made the very famous speech, uh, Ich bin ein Berliner. Okay? So he goes to West Berlin and he's giving this speech to 120,000 West Berliners. So you can see him here, this enormous crowd in the background. Um, and the Ich bin ein Berliner in German means I am a Berliner. Um, and what he was doing in this speech was he was denouncing communism by sort of pointing out the horror of the building of the wall and what that represented in terms of the evils of communism. And he was restating America's commitment to West Berlin, the fact they weren't going to abandon it and that West Berlin would have to remain part of a, um, you know, West Germany and given the liberal freedoms that came with that. Um, now, the speech is a bit of a joke for Berliners because although obviously Kennedy was a very popular president for West Berliners because he didn't abandon them and he sort of kept them in the uh, West German um, state, um, a Berliner is actually a type of donut in Berlin. So if you ever go to Berlin, it's just like those plain donuts with the white icing on top. Um, so the joke is that when he said it could be nine Berliner, even though he was trying to say that he was a Berliner, he actually was sort of saying, I am a donut. So that became a bit of a a running joke for uh, West Berlin is after that. Um, now, in terms of just like the longer or medium term outcomes of the Berlin crisis for international relations, it means a few things. Okay, Now, the first big one in lots of ways is that it really showed that the thaw that had existed in the late 1950s was well and truly over. Right? We saw that in the late 1950s, Khrushchev is talking about peaceful coexistence. Um, he's sort of reaching out to the West to some extent. Uh, McCarthyism has died down in America, so there's more of an opportunity for some kind of negotiation with the Soviets. So you have these five years from maybe 1955 to 1960 where it seems like there might be a possibility of a de-escalation of the Cold War. Now, that's kind of torpedoed first by the Paris Peace Summit um, and the shooting down of the U-2 spy plane that led to that collapsing. But one year later, 1961, the Berlin crisis is a much more uh, severe um, you know, crisis for relations between the Soviets and the Americans. So it really showed that the relationship had deteriorated again um, and it was another escalation. So if you want to sort of think about it almost on the graph, late 1950s, tensions begin to decrease, the shooting down of the U-2 spy plane begins to increase them again. You then get the Berlin crisis and the building of the Berlin Wall, and then it reaches a crescendo in what we'll look at next week, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is probably the time that the two sides come closest to actually going to war. So this is a really important event for the escalation of the tensions that happened in the early 1960s. Now, another key outcome really is that, you know, Kennedy is a new president, but his sort of stance over West Berlin and his refusal to abandon it um, really showed that he was sort of restating the US's anti-communist commitments to containing communism in, in the way that his predecessors Eisenhower and Truman had done. So it showed that he was going to maintain the traditional American policy towards the Soviet Union. Um, 
Another sort of ironic or slightly counterintuitive outcome of it was in some ways it did actually ease the tensions in Berlin and Germany itself. Now, the reason for that is that the building of the wall kind of allowed the Allies to and the uh, Soviets to both get what they wanted, right? For the Americans, they wanted West Berlin to stay part of West Germany and to you know keep it within the Western sphere of influence. Um, and Khrushchev obviously needed to solve this problem of the defect as escaping from West Berlin um, and to prevent future spying. So the building of the wall, although obviously it's, it's sort of seen as this horrific symbol of communist oppression, it allows Khrushchev to solve the defect problem and prevent any Western spying from West Berlin, whilst also allowing Kennedy to say, well, that West Berlin has remained part of West Germany. Um, and that's why Kennedy makes this sort of quote where he says, it's not a very nice solution, but a wall is a hell of a lot better than a wall. Okay? So it's not a good solution, but it's a way of solving both of our mutual problems without a conflict. So ironically, in the short term, it does actually uh, reduce tensions to some extent in West Germany and, and in Berlin as a whole. So another long term sort of outcome probably worth mentioning is also just the fact that the Berlin Wall obviously itself becomes a really powerful symbol of the Cold War and its divisions. Okay, So just the existence of the wall um, became this very important symbol of the divisions of the Cold War. Um, and it's why, obviously, most people's sort of image of the ending of the Cold War is when the Berlin Wall was torn down in 1989, that, you know, it's seen as the sort of symbol of the ending of the Cold War. So the building of it is largely seen as a sort of symbol of the divisions of the Cold War, and it coming down in 1989 with the collapse of the communist government in East Germany is seen as the sort of powerful symbol of the end of the Cold War. So that's a quite an important symbolic and reason that the Berlin Wall was important. Okay. Now, just to finish off, guys, so you've got eight questions there, or sorry, nine questions even, and from pages 64 to 68, the first five roughly from 64 to 65, and the rest on uh, 66 to 68. Um, I'll also put just in the notes for this lecture the Cold War. Uh, CNN series episode on the Berlin Wall's building is really excellent and a lot of the stuff we're talking about the building of the wall and such you can understand it a lot better if you actually see the footage it's a very very powerful episode of that series so I'll put that in notes for the lecture and you can use that if you want to as a supplement to your notes okay but I think that's a really really good episode even just watching it don't take any notes it's or just kind of like bring the subject to life a lot more so I would really strongly recommend that you do that once you've done your notes on these nine questions, okay? Um, right, next lecture, we're going to be looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis, okay? So make sure to get this done. Um